On today's sports cars, high performance does not necessarily mean larger engines. Current technology allows four-cylinder and six-cylinder engines to meet or exceed the output of some eight-cylinder engines. The same technology holds true for trucks, whose engines are designed to get as much pulling power and fuel efficiency as possible from each cubic inch of displacement. Methods of boosting engine performance include the use of turbochargers, superchargers, and intercoolers. As a service technician, you need to know how to diagnose and repair turbocharger systems. This requires an understanding of turbocharger theory and major components. You should also understand what an intercooler is and how it operates. Additionally, you need to be aware of how turbochargers are controlled and how they affect engine operation. In a typical internal combustion engine, the intake stroke of the piston draws or pulls in air and fuel. When the flow of incoming air is determined only by the movement of the piston, the process is known as normal aspiration. During normal aspiration, the piston moves down and draws air through the engine's intake manifold, where fuel is added. The piston draws the air-fuel mixture, known as the fuel charge, into the combustion chamber. On the compression stroke, the piston moves up in the cylinder bore, compressing the fuel charge for ignition by the spark plug. The power of combustion pushes the piston down in the cylinder, which causes the crankshaft to rotate. The cycle is completed as the piston moves up to expel the resulting exhaust gases. However, to increase power, intake air can be forced into the combustion chamber with the use of a compressor. As intake air is pressurized or boosted, oxygen molecules are forced closer together, increasing their density. For every cubic inch of air, there is now more oxygen available for combustion, thereby increasing power output. This process of pressurizing air before it enters the combustion chamber is known as boosted aspiration. Boosted aspiration can be accomplished by turbocharging or supercharging. With turbocharging, exhaust gas energy drives a turbine, which in turn drives a compressor to boost the pressure of air entering the intake manifold and the combustion chamber. The turbocharger is essentially an air pump in which a turbine wheel in the engine's exhaust path is connected by a shaft to a compressor wheel in the engine's intake path. As exhaust gases spin the turbine, the compressor pressurizes air entering the engine. In other words, Exhaust gas energy is converted into mechanical rotational energy by the turbine, which then drives the compressor to boost intake air pressure. Two types of superchargers are common. They're characterized by the number of elements they use for compression. Some have a single element, and others feature dual intermeshed elements. Unlike turbochargers, superchargers are located only in the engine air intake path. As the crankshaft-driven belt powers the supercharger compressor, air is forced into the engine's intake manifold. Superchargers are usually mounted directly above the intake manifold. While turbochargers can vary in size, two basic designs are used. Most turbochargers have a fixed geometry that directs exhaust gases into the turbine wheel.
It's called fixed because exhaust gases always strike the vanes of the turbine wheel at the same angle. Some turbochargers have a variable geometry turbine. Movable parts within the turbocharger control the speed and direction of the exhaust gases flowing into the turbine wheel vanes. The exhaust path geometry can be varied to regulate boost output. Regardless of the design used, all turbochargers must be able to withstand extreme operating conditions. Because turbochargers utilize the engine's hot exhaust gases, temperatures can exceed 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to produce effective compressor speeds, exhaust gases must spin the turbine at up to 180,000 RPM. This high speed requires that the moving parts of a turbocharger have very little friction. Turbochargers are designed and built with close tolerances, using special alloy metals to minimize friction and reduce the effects of heat. The addition of a turbocharger usually requires engine modifications to handle the increased power and pressures of boosted aspiration. When intake pressure is increased, combustion pressures are also increased, and greater power output and combustion pressures result in higher operating temperatures. Additional components include ducting, which is used to route intake air through the turbocharger to the intake manifold. Some systems also have an intercooler, which is described in lesson three of this course. An intercooler cools the pressurized air before it enters the engine, resulting in even greater power. Inside the engine, many components are strengthened to handle the increased power output and higher operating temperatures of turbocharging. These include the pistons, crankshaft, rods, bearings, exhaust valves, and exhaust manifold. Most turbocharged engines have a more advanced engine management system requiring additional input sensors and special fuel control, as well as special ignition control compared to engines without turbochargers. This level of control is required to get maximum performance while protecting the engine because turbocharged engines use more air and fuel than a normally aspirated engine. The turbine side of the casting is a structural part of the turbocharger designed to direct engine exhaust gas flow toward and past the turbine wheel. The turbine wheel is contoured and has spiral vanes. It is made of a special steel alloy to withstand the high temperatures in the exhaust path, over 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Attached to a shaft, the turbine is rotated by exhaust gas energy at speeds approaching 180,000 RPM. A compressor wheel is connected to the same shaft as the turbine. As exhaust gases rotate the turbine, the rotating shaft causes the compressor to pressurize air entering the intake manifold. The compressor wheel functions like a fan or blower blowing air into a plastic bag. Pressure inside the bag increases as the fan forces air into it. 
In the case of a turbocharger, the bag is the engine intake manifold. Like the turbine, the compressor wheel is contoured and has spiral vanes. But unlike the turbine, the compressor wheel is made of a lightweight aluminum alloy. The turbine's composition is of steel. This is because the compressor wheel is not within the hot exhaust stream. Being on the intake side of the engine, the compressor encounters much lower temperatures, typically less than 280 degrees Fahrenheit. The compressor side of the casting is also a structural part of the turbocharger. It is designed to collect pressurized air from the compressor wheel and direct the air to the engine intake manifold. The center shaft of the turbocharger must be supported with a very low friction system in order to achieve the high rotation speeds necessary for compressor operation. Excessive friction will prevent the turbine and compressor wheels from spinning freely. On most turbochargers, this low friction support consists of two full floating bushings or bearings. The term floating refers to the fact that oil from the engine encircles the bushings or bearings providing a layer between them and the turbocharger's machined housing. This 360 degree lubrication system surrounding the bearings or bushings has both an oil inlet and return for circulation with the engine's lubrication system. Seals are used to keep oil in the turbocharger's center shaft assembly. This prevents oil, exhaust gas in the turbine, and intake air in the compressor from mixing. Turbocharger seals are usually either labyrinth seals, which are designed with a ring and groove, similar to piston rings, or carbon-faced seals. Carbon facing helps eliminate wear caused by the hot, high-speed internal conditions of the turbocharger. Since friction generates heat, a turbocharger's lubrication system helps to keep operating temperatures down. In addition, oil returning to the engine carries heat away from the turbocharger. But beyond the lubrication system, many turbochargers also incorporate a coolant system. This is usually a jacket manufactured into the turbocharger center housing. A continuous flow of coolant from the engine is circulated through this jacket, where it absorbs heat from the turbocharger. Coolant flows from the cylinder block before it circulates through the engine to the turbocharger housing. The coolant then returns to the engine's cooling system, where the absorbed heat is released at the radiator. Turbocharger boost pressure is controlled by a relief valve known as the wastegate. This valve limits the amount of boost that can be produced by limiting the amount of exhaust gas spinning the turbine wheel.
it can be mechanically or electronically controlled. With the mechanical wastegate, a diaphragm reacts to boost pressure at the intake manifold. When boost exceeds the desired level, typically 7 or 8 psi, the diaphragm moves an actuator rod, which allows some of the exhaust gas to bypass the turbine wheel, lowering its speed. This, in turn, lowers compressor speed and, therefore, the intake air boost. Some turbochargers feature electronically controlled wastegates. These are very similar to mechanical wastegates. However, the pressure signal to the diaphragm is modulated by a vented solenoid. This solenoid is controlled by the engine control module, or ECM, and allows for different maximum boost levels under different operating conditions. For example, boost is limited to a lower pressure during warm-up to protect engine durability. An intercooler is often used to increase the power of a turbocharged engine. A turbocharger compresses air, which also heats it. As air passes through the intercooler, the intake air is cooled before entering the intake manifold. Cooler air is denser, meaning that more oxygen is available for more powerful combustion. The intercooler itself is a finned container. As compressed hot intake air travels through an intercooler, Heat is transferred to the cooler outside air passing over the intercooler's fins, making it an air-to-air -air intercooler. The temperature of the intake air is thereby reduced, and as it cools, it becomes denser. Whereas the radiator is a coolant-to-air heat exchanger, most intercoolers are air-to-air -air heat exchangers. The intercooler transfers heat from the turbocharger intake air to the outside of the vehicle. However, some manufacturers use air to water systems. The intercooler is positioned within the stream of outside air to enhance heat transfer. It is typically located near the radiator, although the exact location varies from model to model. To understand why turbocharging increases power, it is helpful to see the operation of the complete system when a vehicle is under acceleration. The process begins as air is drawn into the system for combustion. As the intake air passes through the compressor side of the turbocharger, it is pressurized, thus increasing the amount of oxygen. Although heated by the turbocharger, the compressed intake air is then cooled by the intercooler. Cooler air is denser, which provides more oxygen for combustion. Controlled by the accelerator pedal, the throttle body regulates the amount of air entering the intake manifold. The intake manifold mixes the air with fuel and distributes it to each of the combustion chambers. On some vehicles, tuned intake manifolds are used to reduce airflow resistance. With tuning, the geometry of the intake manifold is specifically designed to facilitate the flow of air into the engine. The improved flow results in better performance. Inside the combustion chamber, the dense air-fuel mixture is compressed by the piston and then ignited by the spark plug. Because more oxygen is available in the dense air, 
power output is much greater than if the engine were normally aspirated. Combustion creates exhaust, which in turn rotates the turbine and compressor. The cycle repeats over and over again for each cylinder. The overwhelming benefit of turbocharging is combustion efficiency. Turbocharging uses the energy of normally wasted exhaust gas pressure to boost horsepower by 40 to 50 percent without increasing engine size. This retains the fuel economy benefits of a small displacement engine while providing the power that is typical of larger displacement engines. Additionally, turbocharging increases engine performance at higher altitudes where air is thinner. Turbocharging boost levels must be controlled to protect the turbocharger and the engine. On most turbocharged vehicles, a boost gauge is included in the instrument cluster. This gauge shows the driver the amount of boost pressure in the intake manifold. A typical engine control module uses several inputs for engine control, as well as electronic wastegate control when the turbocharger is supplying boost. These inputs include manifold absolute pressure, engine speed, throttle position, coolant temperature, charge temperature, vehicle speed, and detonation. Let's review each. The manifold absolute pressure sensor, also called the MAP sensor, uses a hose from the intake manifold to measure manifold and barometric pressures for the engine control module. Based on signals from the electronic control module, a solenoid controls whether manifold pressure or barometric pressure is sensed. This gives the controller information on the boost level present in the intake manifold. All engine control modules monitor engine speed. On turbocharged engines, different boost levels may be desired at different engine speeds. The throttle position sensor, or TPS, is mounted on the throttle body and measures the opening of the throttle blade as commanded by the driver at the accelerator pedal. Throttle position is not only used by the controller to adjust the air-fuel mixture, it also provides a reference as to what boost should be delivered by the turbocharger. The coolant temperature sensor, typically mounted in the thermostat housing, identifies coolant temperature and therefore engine operating temperature for the controller. Reduced boost levels are used during engine warm-up or at very high engine temperatures to protect the engine and ensure its durability. The charge air temperature sensor is mounted on the intake manifold and measures the temperature of the air-fuel mixture. A charge temperature sensor is typically found on intercooled turbo engines. Since cooler air is more dense and therefore results in more powerful combustion, the intake temperature is important to the engine control module for fuel delivery and spark advance. Information from this sensor is used to reduce boost levels at high charge air temperatures and thereby reduce the potential for detonation or knock. 
The vehicle speed sensor provides information so that boost can be reduced at low vehicle speeds. This helps protect the transmission and torque converter during aggressive drag racing style torque stall launches. Many turbocharged vehicles are calibrated to operate on premium fuel for maximum performance. To protect engines from damaging detonation, also called spark knock, that can occur when lower octane fuels are used, a detonation sensor is usually mounted on the head or intake manifold. Whenever detonation or knock occurs, turbo boost and spark advance are reduced to eliminate knock. Although not measured by a sensor, time in boost is another input for turbocharger control found on some models. The engine control module using an internal clock keeps track of the amount of time in boost to help prevent damage and overheating of both the engine and turbocharger. An additional sensor found on turbocharged models imported by Chrysler is the airflow sensor. It measures the actual flow rate of intake air by creating vortexes or little tornadoes which are detected by an ultrasonic transmitter and receiver. Turbocharging boost levels must be controlled to prevent runaway boost and component damage. The most direct control of the turbocharger is performed by the wastegate. It can operate with or without computer control, depending on the model. The mechanical wastegate is operated by a rod mounted to a spring-loaded diaphragm. The wastegate allows exhaust gas to be diverted around the turbine. While turbocharger inlet vacuum and spring pressure act on one side of the diaphragm, actual boost pressure pushes on the other side. When boost pressure exceeds a certain level, typically 7 to 8 PSI depending on the model, the rod moves and exhaust is diverted. Thus, turbine speed and boost are decreased. Some vehicles feature electronic control of turbocharger boost. They typically use a wastegate solenoid to bleed off boost pressure to the diaphragm per commands from the engine control computer. This precisely controls the amount of exhaust gas passing the turbine and thus the amount of boost produced. As the engine control module varies the duty cycle or on-off time at the solenoid, boost levels can be continuously varied to match the exact engine operating conditions. Fuel control on a turbocharged engine differs slightly from fuel control on a normally aspirated engine. Turbocharged engines use a fuel injection system to deliver a very precise amount of fuel for combustion, as well as increased quantities to match increased boost levels. 
Since high boost pressure forces more air into the engine, more fuel must also be injected to burn with the added oxygen. However, if boost exceeds a programmed limit, typically 14 PSI, fuel is shut off to reduce excessive turbocharger output. This safety feature helps prevent engine damage. Turbocharging typically requires more precise ignition control than is required on a normally aspirated engine. The dense fuel charge must be ignited at a precise time to develop maximum power and prevent engine damage. Inaccurate spark advance can cause excessive exhaust gas temperatures or spark knock, which can also lead to engine and turbocharger damage. A detonation or knock sensor is typically included for ignition control on a turbocharged engine. Many turbocharged vehicles are calibrated to operate on premium fuel. To protect the engine when lower octane fuels are used, the engine control module reduces turbo boost and spark advance if detonation occurs. For the most part, emission control on a turbocharged engine is similar to that of a normally aspirated engine. Due to the pressurized intake on a turbocharged engine, it may seem that exhaust gas recirculation, known as EGR, may be difficult to achieve. However, as with any engine, recirculated exhaust gas is not drawn in for combustion during wide open throttle. Vacuum present within the intake manifold during light and middle throttle draws in recirculated exhaust gas. Some turbocharged engines do not have EGR because the precise fuel delivery and ignition systems result in substantial emission reductions in the catalytic converter. Positive crankcase ventilation, or PCV, allows crankcase oil vapors to be drawn into the intake manifold for combustion. During non-boost conditions, oil vapors are drawn into the intake manifold. During boost conditions, vapors flow to the air cleaner through the valve's hose and then through the turbocharger into the engine. To prevent fuel vapors from being released into the atmosphere, an evaporative control system is used on modern engines. On a turbocharged engine, fuel vapors are drawn into the intake manifold through passages at the manifold and throttle body when the throttle is closed or partially open. During full boost at wide open throttle, Check valves prevent backflow of the fuel charge through these passages and into the canister. During boost conditions, air from the compressor outlet flows through a venturi and draws fuel vapors to the air cleaner. Because this type of evaporative control routes fuel vapors through three different passages, depending on vacuum and boost levels, it is often called a tri-level purge system. Note that some engines use different combinations of these systems.
Precise control of both the turbocharger and engine must be maintained to maximize power and prolong engine life. Lesson 4 covers turbocharger control and related engine operation. A basic inspection of turbocharger related items should not be overlooked as it can uncover a physical problem not indicated by any diagnostic fault code. Verifying that electrical connections are clean and weather tight is important, not only at the wastegate solenoid, but at the various related input sensors for the engine management system as well. One such input sensor is the MAP sensor. Because proper turbocharging requires very specific pressure and vacuum conditions, it is essential that the system is sealed. All control system vacuum hoses must be secure and in good condition. All hoses for intake airflow routing must be secure as well. Verify that engine oil is clean and at the proper level, since the turbocharger uses this for lubrication. Also check the coolant levels on vehicles that use engine coolant for turbocharger cooling. Inspect turbocharger components for physical damage. Note that physical damage can be accompanied by a noise complaint. In addition, make sure there are no exhaust system modifications that reduce back pressure or modifications to the turbocharger wastegate or engine control system. Any of these alterations defeat the logic of the engine management system and may result in damage to the engine and turbocharger. There are wastegate tests you should become familiar with that are part of the complete turbocharger service procedures, such as those found in the Powertrain Diagnostic Procedures Manual. For example, when diagnosing a turbo boost limit exceeded fault on an electronic wastegate, you may need to verify that the wastegate solenoid can control a pressure signal. To do this, disconnect the pressure signal hose from the turbo compressor, then tee in a pressure gauge. Apply 10 PSI to the signal line. It should not bleed down to zero within two minutes. If it does, continue to the next step of the diagnosis as outlined in the service procedure. To test the actuator on both electrical and mechanical wastegates, tee in a pressure gauge to the wastegate actuator and apply 10 PSI to verify that the actuating rod moves. If it does, then the wastegate is operating correctly. Once again, follow the appropriate service procedure to continue your diagnosis and repair of the turbocharger. There are several guidelines you should follow when servicing a turbocharged engine. Whenever you're working near or removing a turbocharger, it is important to wear insulated, heat-resistant gloves, since turbocharger temperatures can exceed 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Since turbochargers are not intended to be rebuilt, they must always be serviced by unit replacement only. 
This is because they're designed and built to meet very specific tolerances in order to withstand extreme operating conditions. As with any vehicle repair, specifying replacement turbochargers requires accuracy when ordering parts. Turbochargers cannot be switched between models and model years. There are some typical turbocharger operational characteristics you should be aware of before you perform a road test. When turbocharger boost level increases, so does the sense of acceleration. Although efforts have been made to reduce the lag or kick-in delay found on earlier turbocharged engines, the sensation of turbo boosted acceleration is obvious. Turbocharger operation may also be identified by the high-pitched sound generated as the turbocharger reaches higher speeds during maximum boost. There are several symptoms that may indicate turbocharger failure. Just as a turbocharger increases engine power, a failed turbocharger decreases engine power by blocking or misrouting intake air needed for combustion and exhaust gases leaving the engine. The result is poor performance. While a characteristic high-pitched sound may be associated with turbocharger operation, a higher-than-normal pitched sound can mean bearing failure as well as a possible lubrication problem. Overboost shutoff is a safety feature that shuts off fuel to the engine when boost levels exceed a set point. This is not a normal condition and will be experienced as an engine cutout under acceleration. If overboost shutoff does occur, there may be a mechanical problem with the turbocharger wastegate actuator or hoses, or an electronic problem in the engine control system, which may be indicated by a fault code. There are wastegate tests you should become familiar with that are part of the complete turbocharger service procedure. There are electronic diagnostic capabilities for most turbocharged engines. Always use service manual procedures and approved tools when diagnosing or servicing turbocharger-related problems. Specific diagnostic codes for turbocharger-related components, such as the wastegate solenoid, are displayed on scan tools, such as the DRB2 or the Mopar diagnostic system, known as MDS. Scan tools also display readings of boost pressure, as seen by the engine control module. Regardless of your electronic diagnostic tool capabilities, published diagnostic procedures and charts must be followed when you're addressing turbocharger conditions.